So yesterday we looked at graphing as a means of solving a system, two equations with two variables. But looking at this first example, when we're trying to solve this system graphically, we have a picture of those two lines and we can see their intersection, but we're not quite sure exactly where that's occurring. We have a good idea, okay, it's in the fourth quadrant, so I have a positive x and a negative y, but what is it really around? Maybe like 1.2 for x and negative a half for y. We can't be very accurate, so we want to move away from just using pictures and actually move to an algebraic method. Because the solution for that thing is actually at this point, 4 thirds which doesn't seem so unreasonable, but trying to guess and check and just observe that it's happening there. A little bit hard, and then the y-coordinate is negative 14 over 27. Way too hard, way too difficult to be able to gather that solution from a picture. So solving by graphing is not always fast or accurate in the cases when the solutions aren't integers, when we have those gross fractions that are involved. So when it's not an integer, it can be a little bit more difficult. So we will develop some algebraic methods. Algebra is always more accurate. So this first method that we're going to learn, we actually learned about it in 090, so a little bit of repeat, but we are going to be looking at the substitution method. Then we'll talk about elimination, and then eventually we'll move to some larger systems of three equations in three variables. Actually pretty interesting. So we're going to look at this first system, and we want to solve it algebraically. Now this guy wouldn't be so bad to graph because all of our um, constants are integers, but we want to move towards algebraic methods. So I'm going to go ahead and label each of these equations, the first one, one, second one, two, just so uh, for notation-wise, we can talk about, well, I'm taking this equation and plugging into this one without having to write it out fully. All right, so looking at equation two, the nice part about this is I already have one of my variables isolated. I know that x is equivalent to this entire quantity, y plus one. So we're gonna use that to our advantage to make an equation just in one variable that we can then solve, because right now we can't solve this other than graphing. So I know x is equivalent to y plus 1, so we're going to go ahead and take equation 2 and sub it into equation 1. So this is my notation, just to say that quickly, and when you come back and look at these notes, you'll be able to follow as well. So wherever I see an x in equation 1, I'm going to go ahead and substitute in y plus 1. I know those things are equivalent. So again, wherever I see an x up here, now I'm plugging in y plus 1 and filling in the rest of the equation. And now we can see we have an equation all in one variable that we can go ahead and solve. Do the parentheses matter here? Sure don't. There's just a 1 out on the front, so we can drop those and combine our like terms. So we've got two y's over there. All right, now we solve. Trying to get y on its own, what's got to go first? The 1. When we subtract it, we're looking at 2y is equal to 3. And we'll divide by 2. y is equal to, I don't think you can see that, y is equal to 3 halves. But we're not quite done there. Because we're trying to find the point that is a solution to this system. So we have the y coordinate and we still need the x. So we can take this value and substitute it back into either one of these equations and it'll give us our result for x. But one of them is going to be easier than the other. So we should go ahead and take this value, y equals 3 halves, and put it into which equation? Equation 2, x is already isolated, that's already on its own. So that's going to be less work for us. So now we're taking this value and subbing it into equation 2. So we can get our x value. So since x is equal to y plus 1, and I know my y value is 3 halves, we can combine those together. 
we need like uh, denominators. So we can rewrite 1 as 2 over 2. So what are we looking at there? I've got 3, 4, 5 halves. So our solution to this system didn't have uh, an x and a y coordinate that were integers. They were fractions. So my solution set just contains this one point. x's come first, 5 halves. y's come second, 3 halves. And again, how can we always check these things? Plug them back into our original equations. Make sure we satisfy both at the same time. And yesterday we started actually uh, characterizing the different types of systems that we were looking at. So these two lines, they're crossing at one point. So we have a solution which makes it consistent. Consistent and the lines weren't the same. So these two lines were independent. So we have a consistent independent system here. We might as well hit those and review them as we go. All right, so two for you to try. Go ahead and use the substitution method on those and we'll talk about them. So again, I'm going to label these guys one and two, one and two, just so when we talk about it, it's a little bit easier. So in part A, easiest route to go. Y is already isolated. It's equivalent to X plus 2. So wherever I see a Y up here, I'm going to be plugging in X plus 2 and solving it. So I'm taking 2 and subbing it into 1. And we'll see what happens. So my X value comes first. My Y is equivalent to X plus 2. We have an equation all in one variable. These parentheses don't matter, so we can combine our like terms. Got two x's, constant two is equal to six. Solve for x, when we subtract. Two x is equal to four, which means what for our x value? x is equal to two. But that's only half of it. We still need the y coordinate. So again, which one is going to be the easiest to substitute back into? Equation 2, because y is already on its own. So we're going to sub that one into 2. We know since y is equal to x plus 2, y is going to be what value? 4 altogether. So we have one solution, one point that satisfies both equations at the same time. x coordinate comes first, y coordinate comes second. And again, what kind of system are we dealing with? Consistent independent. They're touching once, and they're not the exact same line. All right. Second one, again, our y is already isolated in the first equation. So wherever I see a y down here, I'm going to substitute in what I know it's equivalent to, 7 minus x. So we're going to go ahead and take 1 this time and substitute it into 2. It really doesn't matter, it's just how the cookie crumbles. We could have written them in a different order, still get the same answers. So again, wherever I see a y in my second equation, I'm plugging in this piece. So we're looking at 2x minus 7 minus x is equal to 8. So in this example, did our parentheses matter? Sure do, because we have a negative on the outside. So to get rid of those parentheses, we have to distribute that in. So when we do that, what do we get out? Into my first term, we get minus 7, and a negative times a negative will give us positive x. Combining our like terms, I've got 3x's over here. And we've got to go for x. Adding 7 to both sides, we've got 3x is equal to 15 which means our x value is 5. But that's only half of it. We still have to go for our y value, which is the easiest one to sub back into. The first, since our y is already isolated. So 7 back into 1, what are we getting out there? y value is equal to 7 minus what we know x is equivalent to. So we're looking at so we've got one solution to this system, x values come first, y values come second. 
And again, both of those are consistent since we have solutions, independent since we're not dealing with the same lines in each case. All right, so we've got a new system. Again, I'm going to go ahead and label first one, one, second one, two. But what's different about these ones that we haven't seen yet? We don't have a specific variable that's isolated. But generally when we're looking at these kinds of systems, there's an easiest route to go. So we want to look for the easiest variable to isolate and actually see what that is. So looking at the two different equations, do we have a variable that already has a coefficient 1 on the front of them? So x in my first equation has a 2, that one's out. y is um, already singular. We only have one of them here. So solving for y in our first equation is the easiest route to go, because all we have to use is subtraction to get it alone. Now it really doesn't matter. You could go for x in the first equation, but you'd have to subtract and then divide. So it's a little bit more work. So our easiest variable to isolate is y in equation 1. So when we take equation 1 and we go to solve it for y, solve 1 for y, what do we get out? To get y on its own, we have to get rid of 2x, so we'll subtract that from both sides. And we still have an equivalent system. This still is equation 1. It's just in a different form. So now we have three different ones to work with. And we like the form of this one, since y is alone. So we're going to go ahead and take this new 1 and substitute that into our second equation. Wherever I see y up here, I'm going to be plugging in this expression. So let's see what comes out. 1 into 2, taking this piece, plugging it in here. 3x plus 4 times this quantity is equal to 4. Okay, now we have an equation all in one variable we can solve. We just had to do that extra step of isolating one of our variables in the beginning. So let's go ahead and get rid of those parentheses. We'll distribute in positive 4 times negative 2 will give us negative 8x. 4 times 6 will give us positive 24. And we can combine our like terms. So we've got negative 5 factors of x. Positive 24 is equal to 4. Get x alone, so we have to subtract 24 from both sides, which will give us negative 20 on the right. So what does that mean for our x value? Negative divided by negative will give us a positive. 20 to divide by 5 is 4. So we have our x-coordinate. We still need the y. So which one do we want to plug it back into? I've got 1, 2, 3 to work with. Wherever my y is isolated, this one is going to be the easiest route to go because I just have to plug and chug. I won't actually have to solve for y in the end. So we're plugging that back into our new equation 1. And let's see what we get out. So we know since y is equal to negative 2x plus 6, y is equal to negative 2 times 4, what we know x is equivalent to. And we can solve that. Negative 8 plus 6 will give us negative 2. So we've got a consistent independent solution. And it happens at 4, negative 2, that point. So whenever we go to solve these, there's generally an easiest route to go. Don't make more work for yourself. And again, how can we always check these? Plug them back into our original equations. Make sure we satisfy both at the same time. So there's two for you to try. Go ahead and take them. Try to go an easier route. But there are lots of different ways to solve these. So looking at this first one, I'm going to go ahead and label them again. One and two. And it doesn't really matter what you try to isolate. X in the first equation is pretty good. That's a good option. And Y in our second equation, since both of those have a coefficient 1. So if you isolated X in the top, that's great. We can go that route. If you isolated Y in the bottom 
and went that route, that's great. You'll come down to the same answer. It doesn't matter. So I'm actually going to go ahead and take 2 and solve for y. Isolate that one because I'm sure a few of you actually took x. So I want you to see this other version. So we're going to go ahead and take equation 2 and solve it for y. Uh, what do we get? Solve 2 for y. y minus 2x is equal to 8. I want y alone, so we're going to add 2x to both sides. Is this the same? It looks really familiar. Weird. So we have our new equation, 2. Still equivalent, just looks a little bit different. So we're going to go ahead and take 2 and plug it into 1. Wherever I see a y up there, I'm going to be plugging in this equation 2x plus 8. So let's do that. Into equation 1. I've got 2 times, maybe this one will be a little bit better. Oh yeah. 2 times what we know y is equivalent to. And the rest of our equation. Tagging along. Wherever I see a y up there, I'm substituting in 2x plus 8. Get rid of the parentheses. When we distribute in, what do we get? 4x plus 16 plus another x is equal to 1. Combined in our like terms, we've got 5x's together. Trying to get x alone, we have to move our constant 16. So we'll get negative 15 on our right-hand side. So what does that mean for our x value? 15 divided by 5 is 3. Okay, but we're only halfway there. We got our x coordinate. We need to go for the y. Easiest thing to plug back into is our new equation 2, where y is already isolated. So we know since y is equal to 2x plus 8, my y value can be solved. So 2 times negative 3 will give us negative 6, plus another 8 is 2 altogether. So our solution set contains one point. It goes through negative 3, 2. And again, we're dealing with what kind of system here? Consistent, independent. We have a solution that makes it consistent. They're independent lines. They're not exactly the same. All right, with our second try, go ahead and label them again. What is the easiest variable to isolate here? Our first equation, all of those variables have coefficients other than 1. In equation 2, x has coefficient 1 and y has coefficient negative 1. We want to work towards the positive so we don't have to divide by negative ever. So we're going to go ahead and solve 2 for x. Doesn't really matter though. You could isolate a different variable, come down to the same answer. This is just the easiest route to go. So when we take 2 and try to solve it for x, we get an equivalent line. To get x alone, we need to add y to both sides. So x is equivalent to y plus 3. This is our new equation 2, still equivalent. All right, and what do we do with that? Wherever I see an x in equation 1, we're going to plug in y plus 3. So we're taking that new 2, subbing it into our first equation. Wherever I see an x, I plug in this new expression. And we'll evaluate the rest of that equation. We have an equation all in one variable. Let's go ahead and get rid of the parentheses and solve. So 8 times y will give us 8y. Eight, 8 times 3 is 24. We can combine our like terms. So on the left-hand side, we've got three y's. We need to get those y's alone, so we'll subtract 24 from both sides. So 3y will be equal to negative 12. So what does that mean for our y value? y is equal to negative 4. We only have half of our coordinate, though, and we need to go back for the x. Easiest one to plug back into is our new equation 2. Since we know x is equal to y plus 3, what does that mean for our x value? Negative 1. So we have a consistent, independent system here. x-coordinate happens at negative 1. y-coordinate happens at negative 4. Again, how can we always check those? 
plug these ba values back in, x and y, to both equations. Make, set, make sure we satisfy both at the same time. I swear I can talk today. Okay, hopefully you're good with those. Let's look at some funny cases and just see what happens. So with our knowledge, just looking at these two lines, we can already tell what. We've got the same slope and different y-intercepts. So if we were going to graph them, they're going to be parallel. So what does that mean if we look at those two lines as a system? If I have parallel lines, how many solutions do I have? What do they look like? And we have to be able to show it algebraically. So in this case, our y's are already isolated in both of them. So it doesn't really matter how we describe it. If I take 2 and plug it into 1, it's the same exact thing. We're just taking each of these and setting them equal to each other. So uh, let's pretend like we're substituting 2 into 1. Wherever I see a y in the top, I'm plugging in this new expression, negative 3x minus 2 is equal to negative 3y, excuse me, 3x plus 5. Okay, so wherever I saw y in the first one, I'm plugging in this new expression. So trying to behave like normal, if we can't see what's going to happen. Let's try to get the x's together, try to get the constants together. So if I try to move negative 3x to the other side, I need to add it to both sides. And what's happening? Goes away on the left, goes away on the right. What are we left with on the left? Negative 2 equal to positive 5. We know that's never going to happen. That's a statement that's never true. We can never make negative 2 be equal to 5. So how many solutions do we have for this thing? Doesn't matter what I plug in, I'm never going to be able to make that happen. So I don't have any solutions. No solutions. And the set notation for that guy, again, is that empty set. And since we were talking about the kinds of systems that characterize each of these, what are we dealing with there? When we're dealing with parallel lines, what kind of system is it? Parallel lines, we don't have a solution, so it's inconsistent. And then looking at the two lines, they're not the same, so those things were independent. Inconsistent, independent. Don't have a solution, that's our first descriptor. They aren't the same lines, that's our second. Okay. Let's look at another one. 1 and 2. x is already isolated in the first, so we're going to take 1 and substitute it into 2. See what happens. So wherever I see an x down here, I'm plugging in 2y minus 1. So we've got 4y is equal to 2 times what I know x is equivalent to. And we'll go ahead and get rid of the parentheses, just doing it in. 4y is equal to negative 4y plus, since we have negative times a negative, 2. And that's all equal to 2. And as we start to combine like terms, what happens? I've got a positive 4y and a negative 4y. Those will go away. So I'm left with the statement 2 is equal to 2, which is always true. Doesn't matter what we plug in. I can always make 2 be equal to true. <laughs> 2 be equal to true. 2 be equal to 2. Always true. So how many different solutions do we have to this thing? Doesn't matter what I plug in. It's always going to be happening. So we have infinitely many solutions. So what kind of system are we looking at? And specifically, how are these two lines related? They're the exact same thing. We're just multiplying by a constant and moving some stuff around. So we have a solution. So our first descriptor is it's consistent, which says we have a solution. And then looking at these two lines, they are the same. So they're dependent on each other. Whatever I plug into one, the exact same thing is going to happen to the other. So we have a consistent, dependent solution. Go ahead and take those next two, solve them, 
and talk about the number of solutions that we have in those cases. Looking at the first system, what's the easiest thing to isolate? 1, 4, x. So we're going to solve equation 1, 4, x. In order to get x alone, what do we have to do to both sides? Add 3y. With that new equation 1, we're going to go ahead and substitute that into equation 2, see what happens. So wherever I see an x in equation 2, we're plugging in this new expression, 3y plus 1. So I've got 6y minus 2 times 3y plus 1 is equal to negative 2. Trying to uh, get rid of the parentheses and get the y's together, we'll see what happens. So I've got 6y, when we distribute in negative 2, we get negative 6y minus 2 is equal to minus 2. Combining our like terms, what happens? We come down to a statement. That's always going to be true. So we have infinitely many solutions here. Infinitely many solutions. We can plug in all real numbers and it'll make it true. And what does that tell me about these two lines? They're exactly the same. They're the same lines. So what kind of system are we dealing with? We have solutions, so it's consistent. And whatever I plug into one is going to satisfy the other at the exact same time. They are dependent on each other. They're exactly the same. Okay. In part B, it doesn't really matter what we go for. We have coefficient 1 on both of these y's. So I'm going to go ahead and just take the first one and solve for y. So what does that mean? What's got to go? 2x, when we subtract that from both sides, we have our new equation 1, still equivalent. We're going to go ahead and take that, plug it into equation 2. See what happens. So wherever I see a y, I'm plugging in this new expression, negative 2x plus 3. And what happens? Combining our like terms, I got negative and positive 2x. They cancel out. We come down to 3 is equal to negative 4. That thing's never true. So we don't have any solutions. Solution set is the empty set. So what kind of lines do we have here? These two things are parallel to each other, and they're never touching. We don't have solutions, so it's inconsistent. And they aren't the same lines. They're parallel, so they are independent. Inconsistent, independent. All right, the last two problems deal with some application. We're going to be talking about the architects who designed the John Hancock Building in Chicago. They created a visually appealing building that slants on its sides, on the sides. The ground floor is the shape of a rectangle that is larger than the rectangle formed by the top floor. So we kind of taper in as we go to the top. The ground floor has a perimeter of 600, excuse me, 860 feet. The length is 100 feet more than the width. We want to find the length and the width. So we want to go for those dimensions. So the very first thing just to say, let our length be equal to L, width be equal to W, but it's pretty intuitive, so we're just going to run with it. What information have they given us? The ground floor is the shape of a rectangle, which is great. We have that to work with. And we have that the perimeter of the ground floor is 860 feet. So how do we get the perimeter of a rectangle? Perimeter just tells me all along the outside. So when we add up those sides, we should get 860 feet. So our first equation, our perimeter is 860. And that's composed of two of the lengths and two of the widths together. Length plus length plus width plus width. We can sum it up like that. But we don't have enough to solve there because we have an equation with two variables. We need it in terms of one. So the other piece of information that they gave to us, the length is 100 feet more than the width. So parsing down that sentence, we know L is, always means equality, 100 feet more than means what operation in mathematics? Not inequalities, operations. 
addition more than our width. So length is 100 feet more than the width. We can literally break it down like that. So now we have a system. We have those two equations to work with. What's the easiest route to go? 2 is already isolated for L, so we're going to go ahead and take that, sub it into 1 and solve. So wherever I see an L up top, I'm going to be plugging in 100 plus the width. So into our first equation, we've got 860 is equal to 2 times our length plus 2 times the width. Don't forget to add on that little chunk key. will contribute a lot. All right, so let's get rid of the parentheses. Distribute in 2 to each of these. Into our first term, we've got 200. Into the second, 2w. And we've got another 2w hanging on. Combined in our like terms, we've got four factors of w all together. So how do we get w on its own? What's got to go next? Subtracting 200, we're looking at 660 is 4w. When we do the division, 660 divided by 4, we're looking at our width of 165. And now this is an application problem. This is in real life that this is occurring, so we need some units. We can't have a building of 165 inches for a width. It would be real tiny. We're dealing with 165 feet on the width. And we still need to solve for the length. So the easiest one to plug this back into equation 2, since the length is already isolated for us. So what does that mean for our length? 165 plus another 100 will give me 265. And again, we have units for that. So whenever we have an application problem, we want to sum it up with a little sentence. So the length of the ground floor, ground floor is 265, and width is 165. And again, how can we always check those? Plug them back into our equation, make sure that they hold true. So we have another very similar problem for you dealing with the top floor of the building now. Still the shape of a rectangle, but its perimeter is only 520 feet. The width is 60 feet less than the length. Find the length and the width. So just parsing down that sentence again, we know that we're dealing with the perimeter, and our perimeter for the upper floor is 520 feet. Two times the length plus two times the width. We have the first equation of our system, and the second one comes from our second sentence. The width, w, is what? 60 feet less than the length. So I'm removing 60 feet from what? From L. So L has to come first. We have the length, and we're removing 60 feet. So the width is... 60 feet less than the length. We kind of read those backwards um, intuitively. So we have a system, one and two, easiest route to go. W is already isolated, so we'll take L minus 60, sub it into one. So when we do that, what do we get out? 520 is equal to 2L plus two times our substituted a w value. We have an equation all in one variable. We can go ahead and solve. Distributing in to get rid of parentheses, what are we getting out? 2L and minus 120. Combining our like terms, we've got 4L all together. To get the length on its own, we have to add 120 to both sides. So what are we looking at? 640 is 4L. Dividing by 4, that means our length, we're looking at 160 feet. And we have units on there. So to go back for the width, the easiest thing to plug it back into is equation 2. So we'll go ahead and do that into equation 2. See what comes out. 
W is equal to 160 minus 60, so we're looking at 100 feet. So as always, give me a little sentence telling me what happened, the length of the upper floor is, what is it, 160, and width is 100 feet. We can always check, plug it back into the original equation, make sure it holds true. All right, so now we have some algebraic methods. We'll look at the elimination method come up next week. But go ahead and get started on the homework. If you have any questions, let me know. Shoot me an email, give me a call.